talk to you this morning about this man who was healed at the pool of Bethesda. And I don't, we, we've probably talked a little bit about how the readings get selected. It doesn't really have anything to do with me. There's a group of all the mainline churches, the Lutherans, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, they all get together, even the Catholics are in there. They all get together and they choose the readings for a three-year period. And some stuff gets put in and some stuff gets left out. And sometimes I think the stuff that gets left out probably shouldn't have gotten left out. And we're gonna talk this morning about what was left out as much as we are about what was left in. So I think this story is a little more interesting than maybe we expect it to be. Because when we hear the story read in church, it always ends the same way. Jesus tells the man to pick up his mat and walk, and the man does, and then it ends with, and the day that this happened was a Sabbath. There's a lot more in that last little sentence than we would think. But I want you, in order to get you in the right frame of mind for the message this morning, I want you to just imagine that you had been invalid, unable to get around at all for 38 years. That for 38 years, you got taken to this pool and laid by the side of the pool. Because, see, the idea was that every once in a while, the water's in the pool would get all riled up. And, and the idea was that this was an angel that had come down and, and, and got the waters all, all stirred up and the first person to get in the pool uh, would be healed. 38 years having somebody carry you and lay you by that pool, having somebody carry your mat and lay it by you. 38 years of laying and watching everybody else come and go. 38 years of watching people lead healthy and happy lives. 38 years of watching other people go to work, get married, have families. 38 years. Imagine what that must have been like. Now imagine that somebody who you've never seen before, somebody you didn't know, comes along, takes a little interest in you, and just tells you to pick up your mat and walk. And you're able to do it. What would that be like? What would that feel like? What would your reaction be to that person? Imagine what that would be like. Imagine how you would feel towards him. Imagine what you would want to do to pay him back. And then listen to the rest of the story. Like I said, the story that we heard in the gospel reading ends with, and the day that it happened was a Sabbath. Here's the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say, starting with verse 10. And if you know what I'm talking about when I say, as Paul Harvey would say, you're showing your age. <laughs> starting with verse 10. So the Jews said to the man who had been cured, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your mat. But he answered them, the man who made me well said to me, take up your mat and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said you take it up and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had disappeared in the crowd that was there. Later Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Do not sin anymore, so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Therefore the Jews started persecuting Jesus because he was doing such things on the Sabbath. That's the rest of the story. Got a couple different things we need to talk about here this morning. First of all, I would like to talk about the Jewish authorities. They see this guy who had been carried through the streets for 38 years and laid by that pool. They see him up 
and strutting down the road with his mat over his shoulder. And what's the first thing that they say? Hey, what are you doing carrying your mat on the Sabbath? Is it just me or is that a ridiculous response? They didn't say, Hey, aren't you the guy who gets carried through the streets and laid by the pool? Ever since I was a little kid, I remember you being laid by the pool. No. There was no joy. There was no love. There was no rejoicing with the man. Their first response was, hey, you're breaking the rules. Wow. Wow. Wouldn't you think they would want to know who did this so that they could go worship him? Or so that they could at least go offer him some of their thanksgiving? Maybe just so they could pay a little closer attention to find out what's really going on with this guy? I mean, the the man who was healed wasn't from out of town. He didn't come up for this faith healing show and then have Jesus whack him on the forehead and trot off. They'd know who this guy was. 38 years he'd been laying by that pool. 38 years. And they see him walking, and their first reaction is, you broke the rules. Think about that. That guy, he didn't just get healed. He was made well. Because if you've been laying for 38 years and you haven't used your legs for 38 years, you're not going to just hop up and walk when whatever is causing you to not be able to walk in the first place is gone. Your legs are going to be atrophied. You're going to need years of physical therapy. Maybe at the end of years of physical therapy, you can kind of sort of get along. You're probably never going to be strong enough to throw that mat up over your shoulder and bebop off down the street. That's an amazing thing that happened. And the Pharisees simply were worried that he broke the rules. And if you think about it, he he was right. He was right from the Pharisaical way of thinking. All that other stuff just doesn't really matter. What matters is, do you follow the rules? And this man was not following their rules. The rules were stupid, but they were religious about following them because they thought those rules made them right with God. And when I say their rules were stupid, if you think I'm being a little bit harsh, guess what happened? You, was there a rule about carrying the guy down to the pool on the Sabbath? Nope, no rule about that. Was there a rule about somebody following along the people who were carrying him to the pool, carrying the mat for him to the pool? Nope. No rules against that. There's a rule against carrying your own mat on the Sabbath. And they thought, like I said, that those rules made them right with God, and they were so religious about their rules that when the Son of God showed up right in front of them, doing something so amazing, so incredible, so dramatic, as making this guy who had been laying by that pool for 38 years stand up and walk and be healthy enough to throw his mat over his shoulder, even though he was right in front of them, their religiosity for the rules made them miss the Son of God. So the following the rules didn't bring them closer to God. It pushed them further away. They had chosen being right over being happy. And in the end, they were neither one. Now let's talk for a minute about this man. There's nothing anywhere in this passage that shows this man having a speck of faith. Nothing in here in this entire passage that shows him showing any sort of gratitude for what Jesus had done for him. In fact, when he was uh, confronted by the Pharisee 
about carrying his mat on the Sabbath, about breaking the rules, he immediately deflected the blame from himself to the man who had healed him. The man whose name he hadn't even bothered to ask. The man whose name he hadn't even bothered to learn. If you've been laying by the side of the pool for 38 years, if you've been hauled back and forth out there for 38 years, if somebody healed you and made you well enough to stand up and walk and carry your mat, do you think you might have asked who he was so you could say thank you? This man had no idea who he was. But when he meets Jesus again in the temple and he finds out what his name is, what does he do with that information? He runs right back to the authorities and says, hey, that guy you're looking for, his name is Jesus. Go harass him. Leave me alone. I think I'm, I'm pretty safe saying that I don't have much in common with this man. I honestly believe, I, I, I'm serious, I, I don't think I have anything in common with this man who was healed. Unfortunately, I find myself pretty clearly in one of the characters in this story. There's only three characters, and guess what? I don't find myself uh, with Jesus uh, too much. Certainly don't see myself sharing much in common with this man. Unfortunately, I share a lot in common with the Pharisee. I share a lot in common with that Pharisee because I like rules. I should clarify that. I like my rules. I don't like your rules. In fact, most of your rules kind of stink, except for where they cross over to my rules. My rules are great. They really are. <laughs> they, they really are. I'm convinced that if everybody in the world would just decide... Just put aside all of, all of their, you know, arrogance and just follow my rules. The world would be a great place. <laughs> yeah, you're arrogant, right? I want you to follow my rules. If everybody would just follow my rules. Now, in order for this to work, God would have to go along with it too. Because, frankly, in my little warped way of thinking, my rules are sort of better than his rules also. But if that would happen... My goodness, would you guys be happy? If we would just all live by my rules, we would be really happy. Everybody could be happy. Let me tell you about my rules. I have one main rule, one big rule. All the other little rules sort of serve the big rule. And the number one rule is you get what you deserve so that good stuff happens to good people, people like us. So all the good stuff that happened would happen to those of us in here. The bad stuff would happen to the bad people that are out there that aren't like us because they're not following my rules. And all the other rules would just work around that, and life would be good. Everyone would get what they deserve. And let me tell you something about this guy laying by the side of the pool who Jesus healed and told to take up his mat. That guy was a jerk. His actions showed it. He was a faithless, ungrateful coward. And if I were around back then, we would not have been friends. In fact, I would have gone out of my way to avoid having to deal with with that guy. And if we did ever happen to pass, my initial response would be to give him a piece of my mind and just make sure that he knew what a jerk I thought he was. Because he was a despicable character. The way he treated Jesus when Jesus had brought healing to him was terrible. But here's the thing that's funny 
about this whole reading. Here's the thing that's funny about my own twisted worldview. This guy was not the only guy around the pool. There's no way he was the only one around the pool. There would have been tons of people around the pool. There always was tons of people around that pool. And out of all the people with all the sicknesses who had been laying around that pool for however long, Jesus chose to heal this miserable chump. Man. I don't like it when the jerks win. I just don't. I don't like it when bad behavior is rewarded. I don't like it because it breaks my rules. My rules are good behavior gets rewarded, bad behavior doesn't. But that's exactly what Jesus did. He went and broke my rules. He went and healed the jerk. And he healed the jerk because, thank God, thank God, he deals with us not according to who we are, but he deals with us according to who he is. And when I stop for just a minute and I realize how religious I am about following my arrogant rules, I'm very thankful for that. I'm very thankful that he deals with me not based on who I am, but based on who he is. Because far often, far more often than I care to admit, I'm a jerk. Hon, you could jump up any time and stop me. No, she's not going <laughs> to. Maybe less often than Cheryl would say, but more often than I care to admit, I'm a jerk. More often than I care to admit, I'm, I'm not worthy. More often than I care to admit, I'm a Pharisee. Let's face it, most of the time, maybe all the time, yeah, let's be honest, we're in church. All the time. I am no more worthy of God's grace and mercy than that jerk who is laying out by the pool at Bethesda. So family, when we see someone that we think of as a jerk being rewarded by God's grace, rather than being upset about it because it breaks our rules, let's try to be thankful for it. Let's try to be thankful for the fact that we live under God's rules rather than under Dan's rules. Be thankful for the fact that we don't get what's coming to us. And knowing that our Father loves everyone, not just us, not just us good people in here, but those people out there just as well, that he loves them just as much as he loves us. We're able to do that. We're able to show a little more grace and mercy and forgiveness. We're able to pray for our enemies a little bit more often and a little bit more honestly. Maybe, just maybe, knowing how much we're loved, we're a little more willing to put ourselves in the shoes of that jerk and try to walk a mile in their shoes and maybe try to understand a little bit better why they are the way they are before we dismiss them as human beings, before we decide that we don't want anything to do with them. 
maybe we can do all those things because we are finally secure in our own places. We're secure in the fact that we are beloved children of God, that he loves us unconditionally. And really his big rule, the rule that all the other little rules serve, is to love him and to love our neighbors and to love ourselves. And so when we go to love our neighbors, that doesn't just mean all the good people that are in here. It means some of the people that are out there that are a little bit harder to love. But we can do it. We can do it because we've been loved first and best. Amen.